It's good to be in chapel today. It's good to celebrate, to lift up the name of the Lord and to celebrate the legacy of a servant family. May it be said of us when we all get to heaven that we were faithful to the Lord on the earth. Let's stand together and sing this morning. When we all get to heaven, we'll sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the toils of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon His beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, We'll sing and shout the victory. Now, I, I happen to know that one of Dr. Level's favorite songs is this next one we're going to sing. So we're going to do it as a big gospel quartet this morning. Go ahead and flip the slide there. so we, Okay, so a big gospel quartet. You know the parts. You sing out on this one, all right? Doc, you want to come and sing the melody with me? No, Okay. I wouldn't have done that when he was president before, but now he's done. So let's <laughs> let's sing it together. I'm kind of homesick for a country to which I've never been before. No sad. Time won't matter anymore. View a land I'm longing for you, and someday on the other Where am 
best day of your life. You remember it? I mean that day that was just absolutely perfect. Maybe it was a great event that happened. Might have been your salvation. Might have been your marriage. Might have been the birth of your first child. Might have been a day when you got the most glorious news you'd ever had in your life. Might have been a day that was absolutely perfect because of weather or company or something. Imagine and remember the very best day of your life. You got that day in your mind? You know what God calls that day? Practice. That's just practice. Because the very best day you've ever had in all of your life you'll look back on as less than the worst day you'll ever spend in eternity. And those good days are practice for a glory we know is on the way. That's our hope. That's what makes every week something exciting. We know a better day is coming. I'm going to ask Roland Q. Level II if he would come and join me on the platform and lead us in a word of prayer. Roland Q. Level II is named for the president of our seminary, Roland Q. Level, for whom this chapel is named, one of the greatest presidents in the history of this seminary. He is the man who moved our chapel from its uptown location to this present location. We would not be the seminary we are today if that move had not been made. In addition to his tremendous work as president, he was also one of the three or four most important people in the history of Southern Baptist evangelism for his work as head of evangelism for the Southern Baptist Convention before he became president of our seminary. Truly a great, great man, one of our former presidents, and Roland Q. Level II was named in his honor. Would you please come and lead us in a word of prayer? He's a Baptist layman from First Baptist Church of Jackson, Mississippi. Please join me in prayer. Father, we cannot reflect upon this institution without reflecting upon those that have made it what it is. Not only the administration, and the faculty, but also those students that have come through these halls, dedicated themselves to study, to learning, and a greater knowledge of you. Father, this is a great day, not only as we reflect upon this institution, but those that have made it what it is. And Father, not only for those that have made it what it is today, but those that will make it what it will be in the future. Father, we reflect today again upon your goodness upon each of us individually and upon this institution. We praise you for who you are and for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Before you sit down, turn to somebody next to you and just remind them a better day is coming. Would you do that? Thank you so much. This is a very special day in the life of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. We welcome you to a time of worship and praise in Level Chapel on the campus of our seminary to join us with this very special day. A husband and wife, a mom and a dad, many years ago in the 19th century, the latter half of the 19th century, made a commitment before God when they were married that they were going to live as Christians and raise their family in the ways and word of God. George Washington Level and Cora Berry Level had nine sons. Those nine sons went on to become a tremendous force in the kingdom of God and in Southern Baptist work. They literally gave shape to the Southern Baptist Convention in the early years of the 20th century, in the middle part of the 20th century. They went on to have a tremendous impact on the entire convention and its developing programs. And between them, they had just about every kind of responsibility you could have in a Baptist church. Every kind of staff position, missionary, all sorts. You're going to see the story in just a moment. We're going to celebrate the legacy of this great family. Our trustees, as we thought about the name for our College of Undergraduate Studies, and we thought about the mission of our College of Undergraduate Studies, our trustees made the determination that they wanted that college to be named Level College in, or, in honor of this wonderful Level family. For it's our heart's desire that every graduate of Level College, indeed of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, would go on to have the kind of world-shaping impact that these nine boys and their descendants have had on our Southern Baptist Convention and on our world. You heard me say a word about Roland Q. Level, former president. Let me say a word of introduction about our preacher for the day, Dr. Landrum P. Level II. 
seventh president of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, my predecessor in this office. He's the longest serving president of the history of a seminary and by far the most productive. Just pick out a, a statistical measure, a way that you want to measure progress and success in the seminary's life. And when you look at the ministry of Dr. Landrum P. Level II, you will see he was far and away a home run hitter. Just to give you an idea of a few of the things that you are experiencing right now today that he's directly responsible for. He started our program of Extension Center Education. Now we have extension centers located all over the southeastern United States, uh, teaching students day by day, week by week, year by year, who don't have to uproot their family and come here to campus. If that's not what God's calling them to do, they can do much of their work right there in Extension Center. About 45 to 48% of our enrollment are in those 16-plus extension centers located all over the southeastern United States. Dr. Level is responsible for our use of educational technology. He started us in a form of technology called compressed interactive video, so a class right here in New Orleans can be joined by a classroom in Atlanta or Miami or up to four different cities, and everybody talking back and forth, just like we are in this room, uh, just a piece of glass separating them uh, in addition to those miles. That was started under Dr. Level's watch. If you're here receiving scholarship aid, we had a greater growth in our scholarship endowment under Dr. Level's leadership than any other time in all of our school's history. If you're one of the families who are moving into our brand new student housing, uh, those four bedroom apartment buildings, you need to be very grateful to Dr. Level because we had virtually no endowment when he became president and we went from virtually nothing to more than $25 million in endowment and it was that endowment that helped us finance the building of those new apartment buildings. We were only able to do that because of his success and hard work at the fundraising end of it. He is, by any standard of measure, one of the great presidents in the history of this institution. But I think the very most precious gift that he gave our seminary is not all of the accomplishments that he had as president. I guess you could sum up the very best gift he gave our seminary, and I've thought of this so many times when I've looked around at other Southern Baptist entities. When Dr. Level retired and turned over the reign to the seminary for its next chapter, not only was it a healthy seminary, not only was it a growing seminary, Dr. Level turned over the reins in such a way that we never had to have a single fight about our past. We could focus all of our energy on the future. And in every respect, as we've been working on building that next chapter, building on the foundation that he and Roland Q and the other presidents established, as we've been working on that next chapter, in every respect, He's been very supportive and encouraging. I hope all of you have an opportunity at least once in your life to be able to follow a truly great man because that has been my opportunity as president of New Orleans Seminary. This day is a very special day for several reasons. We're going to have the privilege of hearing Dr. Level preach, and I ask him just to open his Bible and let her rip, give us a good old uh, gospel message, and not uh, talk too much about the family because we're going to take care of that in another way. You're going to see a video presentation telling the story of the Level legacy in just a few moments. Uh, after the service is over, we're going to adjourn and go over to Hardin Student Center where we'll have a reception time set up. And let me translate that Greek for you students. Free food. We'll have a reception time set up uh, over in Hardin Student Center. I invite you to join us. You'll have an opportunity to meet members of the Level family uh, and Dr. Level and have a chance to get to know them a little bit. And then at 1130, we're going to go upstairs to dedicate the Level Legacy Room. And that is, I guess you could call it a museum room, a heritage room that's been put together with various memorabilia from the story of this magnificent family and the impact they've had on the Southern Baptist Convention. And you'll be a part of our grand opening. We'll have a ribbon cutting and then we'll go in to see that. To allow all of our students and faculty to participate in this dedication, today only we're pushing back the start time for our 1130 classes to 12 o'clock. All 1130 classes will start at 12 o'clock, and we hope you'll be able to be a part of that dedication of the Level Legacy Room. As I have thought so many times through the years of my life about this wonderful family and the great impact they've made on me, I've been reminded again and again and again and again of how important your families are. And I hope and pray, ladies and gentlemen, as you are here preparing for ministry, that you understand one of the very important parts of your ministry is the time you are spending with that husband, with that wife, with those children, because you may find out that perhaps the greatest legacy of all is going to be not in what you do, but in what your children do. 
Before we see the video, let me just introduce to you, and I've not asked them to stand, uh, but we'll just quickly introduce to you and let you know members of the Level family who've been able to join us uh, for this dedication time today. Lander P. Level II, our preacher for the day, son of Leonard Level, President Emeritus of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Joanne P. Level, his wife, and daughter-in-law of Leonard Level. Lander P. Level III, son of Landrum and Joanne and grandson of Leonard Level. David E. Level, son of Landrum and Joanne and grandson of Leonard Level. Anne Level Beecham, daughter of Landrum and Joanne and granddaughter of Leonard Level. Joanne Level Beecham, daughter of Anne, granddaughter of Landrum and Joanne and great-granddaughter of Leonard Level. David Level Beecham, son of Anne, grandson of Landrum and Joanne, great-grandson of Leonard Andrew Level Beecham, son of Anne, grandson of Landrum and Joanne, great-grandson of Leonard. Roland Q. Level II, son of Landrum and Joanne, grandson of Leonard. And Lisa Level, his wife of Roland Q. II, daughter-in-law of Landrum and Joanne. Roe Level, son of Roland Q. Level II and Lisa, grandson of Landrum and Joanne, and great-grandson of Leonard. Lucy Level, daughter of Roland Q. II and Lisa, granddaughter of Landrum and Joanne, and great-granddaughter of Leonard Level. Margaret Level Mann, sister of Landrum P. Level II and daughter of Leonard Level. Shuggie Collinsworth, daughter of Margaret Level Mann, granddaughter of Leonard. Eugene Tyre, friend of Margaret Mann, her pastor from First Baptist Church of Noonan, Georgia, and adjunct professor at New Orleans Baptist Seminary, the North Georgia campus. His wife, Margaret Tyre, also able to join us. Frank Level, Jr., son of Frank Level, Sr., and a retired professor from Baylor University. Barbara Level, wife of Frank Level, Jr., daughter-in-law of Frank, Sr. Dottie Level Hudson, daughter of Roland Q. Level. Carl Hudson, husband of Dottie Level Hudson and son-in-law of Roland Q. Level. Wesley Bowman, husband of Mary D. Level Bowman, now deceased, and son-in-law of Roland Q. Level. West Bowman, son of Wesley and Mary D. Level Bowman, and grandson of Roland Q. Level. Dorothy B. Bowman, daughter of Wesley and Mary D. Level Bowman, granddaughter of Roland Q. Sarah Wilson, sister of Joanne Level. Raymond Wilson, brother-in-law of Joanne Level. Phil Walton, a friend and his wife Jane, friends of the Levels who've endowed a chair in honor of Dr. Level. And Lisa Vickers, a longtime friend of the Levels and the NOBTS campus decorator. Much of this has been made possible through the generosity of a very precious Baptist couple. Mike and Ginger Moscow uh, paid all the expense for us to move the Level Legacy Room, which for many years had been here in the back corner of Level Chapel, over to its present site. They did that gracious gift so we would not have to use any cooperative program money in order to do that. It was a gift of love, and we thank them for what they made possible. Today is a very special day. Watch the story of the Level family and be challenged with the question, what is your legacy? I hope that friends who come to the Level Museum will come looking for the hand of God in the lives of some God-called people, some godly people, and I particularly want you to focus on the grandmother and the grandfather of mine and the nine Level boys. They made an immense contribution to the growth and development of the Southern Baptist Convention. And this museum, I trust, will help us to get a grasp on their contribution and to give us a greater appreciation of the lives they lived and the contribution they made. The Level Legacy at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary and Level College began many years ago 
in the lives of George Washington and Tara Perry Level, who reared nine sons, eight of whom were involved in some type of vocational ministry. My grandparents, George Washington and Tara Berry Level, were godly people. They were committed in their own lives, and their sons grew up committed to the gospel ministry. My grandfather was a deacon in the Baptist church, and among other things, he would take a number of his boys on Sunday afternoon and walk out to North Oxford, and they would have preaching, and that ultimately resulted in the North Oxford Baptist Church, which today is the largest church in the city of Oxford. My grandfather served in the Civil War. He was wounded. Grandfather was a, a patriot. He was a man who loved his country and who was willing to sacrifice for the cause that he believed in. My granddaddy was a banker. My grandmother was a housewife and a mother. She was a disciplinarian, but she was a woman who was godly and was instrumental in promoting woman's missionary union work in the state of Mississippi. She was president of the statewide WMU. The godly examples of their parents inspired the nine level sons to leave their own legacies as well. The younger Landrum level describes his uncle's contributions to Southern Baptist life and life in general. Beginning with my uncle Landrum, who was one of the founders of the old BYPU, Baptist Young People's Training Union. He worked in Nashville, worked out of Nashville, and he traveled southwide on trains and in days when travel was not convenient, but he covered the Southern Baptist Convention promoting uh, training for the young people. And he made an immense contribution. Well, the next oldest was Arnold B. Level. Uncle Arnold was the only of the one of the nine boys who was not in the gospel ministry. He became a dentist and he moved to California. He was a genial, outgoing sort of fellow. He lived and died in California. The next was Uncle Jim, James B. Level, who was a preacher. He was pastor of the First Baptist Church of Houston, Texas. And from there, he went into full-time evangelism. He was both the most loved and the most hated preacher. When he preached against sin, uh, he was so direct that a lot of people were offended by it. Uncle Jim was a a mighty preacher of the gospel. Uncle George was a medical doctor. He went to China in 1913 as a medical missionary. He established a ministry in Wuchow, and he was responsible for the building of the Stout Memorial Baptist Hospital, which is the hospital where Bill Wallace, a later date missionary, was martyred by the communists. Uncle George worked in China among the people for 25 years, came back to the United States, he established his medical practice in Bristol, Virginia, and continued to serve as a medical doctor until his death. Uncle Frank is noted for his work with Baptist Student Union. He was the man who became the first Southwide director of the BSU. He lived in Nashville. Wherever we were, you'd look up and Uncle Frank was over there with the, with the children. He was genuinely loved and respected among Southern Baptists. Thank you.
The next one was my daddy, Leonard O. Level. Dad was pastor when I was born in Ripley, Tennessee. We moved from there to Leland, Mississippi. Then from there he moved back to Louisville to become pastor of the Deer Park Baptist Church. We remained there for five years, and from there we moved to Gadsden, Alabama, where Dad was pastor of the First Baptist Church. He was very active in denominational activities. He was chairman of the Alabama Executive Committee and on and on. We lived there for eight years and then moved to Newnan, Georgia. And that's where Dad was pastor when he had a stroke and retired and later died. Next was Uncle Clarence. Uncle Clarence was a minister of education. He served the First Baptist Church of Memphis, Tennessee for many years, had an outstanding, notable ministry there. In 1946, Roland Q. Level became the fourth president of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Under his leadership, the seminary relocated from its original Garden District location to its present location on Gentilly Boulevard. Uncle Roland, of course, is one of the best known of the levels, and he had an impact on the denomination in that he became director of evangelism for the Home Mission Board and lived in Atlanta, and he preached throughout the Southern Baptist Convention. He was a pioneer, a, a leader in many ways, but he was himself a personal soul winner. He never failed to try to win people to Christ. He was pastor of the First Baptist Church of Tampa, Florida, when he was invited to come here to New Orleans Seminary, he remained here for 12 years. Among other things, they named the chapel at New Orleans Baptist Seminary, the Rolling Q. Level Chapel, in honor of Rolling Level and his ministry. He also has a chair of evangelism and various other things that bear his name, recognizing the ministry that he had when he was president. Then the final one, Uncle Ullen, the youngest of the boys. In many ways, he's the best known. He is an author. He was a professor. But before any of that, he and his family served in China for 10 years as missionaries. He came back to the United States. He finished his Ph.D. at Vanderbilt and began to teach. He taught at uh, George Peabody College, went from there to the University of Virginia. He and one of his colleagues are responsible for having revised the well-known and widely used McGuffey Readers. It's material that was used in high schools and grammar schools across the country that had a moral bent to it. He continued to teach and was the director of the McGuffey Reading Clinic at the University of Virginia until his death. I think that's about nine of them, isn't it? <laughs> Dr. Landrum Level II and his wife, Joanne dedicated over 20 years of their lives to New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Like the first, the second level to be president was a builder. Under his leadership, the number of faculty and students and endowment at the seminary significantly increased, exceeding his fondest expectations. Well, it's my judgment that the minister who is fully trained ought not to just have head knowledge. He needs to have heart knowledge. He needs to have a heart for God. He needs to have a heart for lost people. I got it on my heart that there was a vast field out there of people that God had called who had never had the advantage of higher education. And I thought the thing to do was to start at the beginning and try to build up and get them with a 
good, solid, accredited college degree. The School of Christian Training, once began by Dr. Levels' Uncle Roland, was revived with the assistance of Dr. Fred Mosley, formerly of the Home Mission Board, and Dr. Jerry Brazil, former pastor of First Baptist Church of Bogalusa, Louisiana, Dr. Jimmy Dukes, director of the seminary's Extension Center program, and Dr. Thomas Strong, who now serves as dean, enhanced this monumental effort in what is now called Level College. It started off in a very humble way. We didn't have a lot of students. Probably had maybe 25 or so. But today, that center, which has become fully accredited baccalaureate education, is named Level College, and it's ministering to maybe seven or eight hundred people. You'll hear those trumpets. And you'll want to be up and be about the thing that God has called you to do. There is no more joyous feeling in the world than that feeling of knowing that you're where God wants you to be. Landrum Level developed a center for evangelism and church growth on the New Orleans Seminary campus. I had a real burden when I came here for Southern Baptist and evangelism. I saw even then, years ago, that we were doing less and less in personal evangelism. And I determined that we needed to establish a center for evangelism and church growth. The Level Center for Evangelism and Church Growth was designed to help pastors and laymen focus their talents and their abilities of leading other people to Jesus Christ. I wanted an opportunity to express appreciation for God's gift of these dedicated servants for these 20 years of unprecedented growth and development in this seminary. Would you join me in just saying thank you to Dr. Lowe? Legacy is one of the most amazing stories in the history of the Southern Baptist Convention. A godly husband and wife committing themselves before God to raise their nine boys in the ways of the Lord. Those nine boys went on to shape the future of the Southern Baptist Convention. The son of one of those nine boys went on to become one of the greatest presidents in the history of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. What a tremendous legacy from the commitment of two parents. It is our prayer that we will not only celebrate the legacy of a level family in this school and the Southern Baptist Convention, but we will be challenged as husbands and wives, as mothers and fathers, to know to make an impact on your children, to raise them in the ways of the Lord, will mean more than a happy family. It can literally mean the changing of the world. May your children raise up the next great legacy in the story of the Southern Baptist Convention. from Lisa Level and hear the message from Dr. Level. Let me sum all this up by saying to the members of the Level family who are assembled today, on behalf of the Southern Baptist Convention and on behalf of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, we want to thank you for the harvest, rich harvest, you have brought God's kingdom through lives well lived. 
and a family well developed. God bless you and thank you for everything. Y'all, I just married into that. Pretty overwhelmed. Thank you so much for today. Talk the sun where the sand in the morning and who told the ocean you can only come this far and who showed the moon where to hide till evening whose words alone can catch a 
One thought's come to me over and over as I've sat here. Be a little kinder to your fellow and paper grader. He may turn out to be the boss one day. (laughs) Chuck was very efficient in grading. I think he's a little too easy on some, but uh, other than that, uh, he did a great job for me, and I'm delighted that he's where he is. You ever had voice lessons? I was going to say, i got a lawyer friend over here, Don Richard. Get your money back. <laughs> they tell me you're not supposed to begin with an apology. But I suppose I have one I need to make. And I might as well make it publicly. I was lukewarm about the movement of the level room and the prayer room and so forth. You know what it means to be lukewarm. Jesus had something to say about that in the Revelation. You ask the average Christian, on a scale of 1 to 10, where are you? Well, I'm about a 5. Ain't that lukewarm? Well, that's the way I was about to move, but I want to tell you, it has been a magnificent transformation. And the entire family joins me in deep gratitude for memorializing our forebears in the way that it has been done. Wonderful, wonderful thing to have done. And it is in a much more obvious and conspicuous place than it was back here. In fact, most of you didn't know it was back there. So, thank you, Dr. Kelly and those associated with him who are responsible for this. And our little decorator friend, Lisa Vickers, sitting there. She's great. And you all have done a wonderful job. Now, I want to direct you to a couple of verses of Scripture found in the seventh chapter of the Gospel of John. These are verses 37 and 38. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow the rivers of living water. My subject this morning is swimming in living water. Father, we thank Thee for Thy truth. Help us to make an application of it today that will stir our hearts and bring us into greater conformity with Thy will and purpose for us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we ask it. Amen. This text was recorded on the last day of the Feast of the Tabernacles. That was one of the great Jewish feasts, and it had particular significance for them. For on that occasion, at the Feast of the Tabernacles, they would pour out a double portion of water. They always poured out water at the feast but a double portion of water to commemorate the gift of God to the children of Israel in the wilderness when they drank from the rock. That rock was provided miraculously and the water never ran dry. 1 Corinthians 10.4 tells us that Jesus Christ is that rock. You know, as our Lord spoke the day that this was recorded, He might have been standing ankle deep in water. The incomprehensible truth that we find here is that He promised that if we drank from the water that He produced, that we would provide living water from our being. We can't sidestep that. We can't wish it would be taken away or that it didn't have any application for us. If you are providing, producing living water, then a little verse that I ran across recently has to do with you. Here it is. When you enter that beautiful city and the saved all around you appear, what joy when someone will tell you 
You invited me here. Living water produces that sort of result. It will mean increased numbers of individuals who will be coming into the kingdom through their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and who will walk with Him throughout their days here on this earth. I spent 26 years at this seminary. Six years as a student and 20 years as an administrator. Now, I know that in this audience today, not a whole lot of you are going to be administrators, but most of you will be servants of the Lord and you'll be serving probably in local churches. And so it's from that background that I want to speak today, not the background of an administrator, but the background of a local church pastor. I expect the starting place is, if we're to produce that living water, it all begins with a passion. I'm sure some of you might say, well, what in the world are you talking about? Have you ever felt that your prayers weren't being answered, that God just wasn't listening and that things weren't going the way they should? And you said, I've prayed and I've prayed and I've prayed and I can't get an answer. You know what the problem is? I figured that thing out. You're not praying right. When you pray in the will of God, the answer will come. But when you come to God and tell Him what you want, you're not going to get an answer. God doesn't respond to that sort of thing. When we're living and swimming in living water, we come to God in prayer saying, as Jesus said, not my will, but thy will be done. I've known scores and hundreds of seminary students who attended this institution who had no foggy idea about what they were going to do, what they were studying for, what they wanted to be. I've heard a lot of them tell me what they didn't want to be, but I haven't uh, heard some of them ever say what they did want to be. Let me tell you something. Tell you how you can get God's call clarified in your own mind. Find a need. And that goes for those of you who are seminary students who drag around here and never identify with a local church and never accept responsibilities in a local church. You don't know anything about the need. Get involved and find out what the need is. And then when you get a passion for that need, you don't have to pray about it. That's God's answer. That's what He intended for you to do. But you have to bring your life in sync with Almighty God. If you have a passion, I would say the first step that you take is to look up. That's job one. By that I mean make a daily commitment to what God has called you to do. Don't neglect your quiet time. i tell you how I excused mine for years as a seminary student. I said, Lord, I'm studying the Bible every day. I wasn't reading it devotionally. You believe that. I was reading it to pass the test. And there's a, there's a big difference. And I found that out. Read the book devotionally, seeking to know the will of God. And when you do, make very sure that God is calling you and that that call is indelible. If God has called you, you never get out from under it. That's for life, folks. God doesn't call two-year journeymen to come and attend the seminary, and then when you get through, go out and get a better paying job. That's not it. The passion that you have comes continuously from looking up and daily seeking to know and to do the will of God. I told a seminary on occasion of an experience that I had here. I've had a number of students when I asked them, well, why are you here? What are you studying to be? They'll kind of shift around and say, well, Mama and them always said I'd make a preacher. Brother, if that's all you've got, you better go on back home. First deacon's meeting will get you. (laughs) 
Mama and them won't be around. But if your call is not clear and passionate, where you feel in your soul there's something you've got to do in response to the call of God, then step back and let somebody else take your place. You're occupying space here that some God-called person would like to occupy. I think a lot of times some students just like Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus went out and didn't know where he was going. When he got there, he didn't know where he was. When he got home, he didn't know where he'd been. And he did it all on borrowed money. I heard two preachers talking one day about a third preacher, and one of them said to the other one, said, you know, that guy may love Jesus, but he hates people. Friend, you don't love Jesus if you hate people. That just isn't, isn't a possibility. Look up. That's part of your passion. And then the, another part of it is, look back. What do you have? Or well, what do you know that a hell-bound world needs? That's the question you've got to answer every day. What is it God has given me that I need to share with a world on its way to a devil's hell? Look back and remember what it is that God has endowed you with. What do you know for sure? My dad told me something when I was just starting out. He said, son, never preach your doubts. He said, if you don't know but one thing for sure, preach that. But don't preach your doubts. Yeah, you'll have doubts along the way. And you'll read some author that'll make you question everything you stand for and everything you believe, what do you do then? Quit reading that stuff. Read the Bible. There's enough in there to keep all of us busy. Preach the Word. And what is the Word of God? Let me tell you very succinctly. There is one Lord. Not many. One Lord. There is one faith. Not many. There is one baptism. Now there's a widespread lie going around that has duped thousands and thousands and even millions of people. And that is that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who is the father of the Lord Jesus Christ, is the God of the Muslims and the Jews and all of the other religions. Not so. That doesn't square with the Word of God. And if you have some other authority, then you need to get out of the seminary and live by the other authority. But if the Bible is your authority, there is one Lord. Now, I know it may be in the category of political correctness for you to suppose to be broad-minded about things like this. Don't be so desirous of being a men pleaser that you deny the basics of the Christian faith. There is only one God, one Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ. There's one faith. Pseudo intellectuals will sneer at that. They'll laugh at you. They'll call you all kinds of names. You know, when I lived here in Louisiana, there, there used to be one way to get down to the farthermost tip of this state, down at Venice, Louisiana. Some of you have been there. One road. Man, you didn't go to Venice in a vehicle other than a boat anyway, but that one road. Now, is it narrow-minded to say, hey, there isn't but one road to Venice? Nobody would think a thing in the world about that, would they? Face up to the fact there is one faith. Jesus said, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. 
That's either the truth or it's a lie. If it's a lie, cut out the light, shut the doors, let's all go home. But if it is true, we better begin to believe it, act like it, preach like it, and tell other people. One baptism. I know a lot of preachers who accept folks for baptism into a, uh, by baptism into a Baptist church who've never been baptized. If, if they'll tell the preacher that they're satisfied with their baptism, what difference does it make what that preacher thinks? It's what the book says. One baptism. That is, for believers only by immersion only. Simple. Anybody ought to be able to understand that. And those who come into your church, if they come from another denomination, so might it be. If they want to be Baptist, let them do it the Baptist way, which we believe is the biblical way. I had a good friend out in Wichita Falls who was a member of another denomination. He had been immersed, but his immersion, as I told him, was in agreement with the doctrines and the beliefs of that church. And that if he became a Baptist, and he had two fine sons and a wife, and they were all four going to join, but they wanted to join by statement. I said, I can't accept you by statement. You need to be baptized in the Baptist fashion. He came back to me about a month and a half later and he said, Preacher said, I was down in East Texas here not long ago and I found a Baptist church down there that will accept me by my baptism. I said, well, go ahead and join that one. You're not going to join this one. And he didn't. But then they organized a new Baptist church in Wichita Falls and they had let the bars down, so we became part of that one. What do you believe? If you don't have any conviction about these things, then maybe you're on the wrong track. I know a church not too far from here that accepted a person from another denomination without baptism and told the church, coming by statement. Is that the reason we're in the mess we're in today? Most Baptists don't have the foggiest notion about what we believe and what we stand for. And that'll get you in trouble every time. And that's the reason you've got people going in every different direction. We're not united as we ought to be because we unite around our common beliefs in the Bible, in the Word of God. Don't get so hard up for a new member that you'll take somebody on the basis of what he's satisfied with. My ordination sermon was preached by a Baptist preacher named Jim Middleton. He was a friend of the family. He and my daddy were good friends across the years. He was pastor of First Baptist Atlanta and then later pastor of First Baptist Church Shreveport. I think that's significant because when he preached my ordination sermon... He took the time to write in the front of the Bible some words of advice. And the words that he underscored were, Preach the Word. Not what you think. Not what you've heard other people say. Not what some egghead has written. Preach the Word. It can stand on its own. Well, you say, you know, it's a rat race out here and we got to do so and so and so and so and we're not going to get these new younger people into our church unless we do. If you're in the rat race, just remind yourself, no matter if you win, you're still a rat. <laughs> Hang tough. That's part of a purpose, isn't it? God's called you, you ought to have a sense of purpose. You need to stay busy and you need to hang tough. Stay busy. Do you ever think you're caught up and you haven't got anything to do? Let me give you a suggestion. Go get a handful of prospect cards and get out yourself and start knocking on doors and sharing Christ with people. You'll be surprised how that will transform your life and your ministry. Any God-called preacher or minister 
who is not a soul winner is an oxymoron. Write that in your book and you can take it home and attribute it to me. (laughs) Stay busy. You know, when we don't have enough to do, we usually fall into a pity party. Oh, poor me. Nobody has it as tough as I have. Nobody has the kind of church that I've got. I have never talked to a Baptist preacher who didn't say, well, my church is not a typical church. They're not any. They're not a single typical church out there. Every one of them is an individual church. And every one of them has individual ways. Kind of like my friend Jerry Clower used to say that come to see us, that we got so many different ways in our house. You're bound to like some of them. Well, that may be true. Let me assure you of one thing. Old, cantankerous church members never die. They just get offended. And there'll be some. You'll have church members, on the other hand, who have visited in a Pentecostal type of worship service or church, and they've experienced an emotional high. It's not how high you jump when the Holy Spirit hits you. It's how straight you walk when you come down to the earth. And those that get up there so high and never come down put a big question mark over that kind of experience. Somebody who's been on the mountaintop and come down and completely avoid getting into the valley where the work is being done and where people get bumped around and bruised and maligned and criticized, for them to fail to do that is to deny the mountaintop experience. What do you think God gives mountaintop experiences for? To prepare us for a greater service. And if you won't walk across the street to share Jesus with somebody who is your neighbor, your experience is pseudo. It's all emotion and no spirituality. When you come off the mountain, are you faithful to your church? Stay busy. Hang tough. Life in the ministry is a rough ride. I came to Gulfport First Baptist Church from First Baptist Church, Charleston, Mississippi. Charleston was a little heaven on earth. They loved the preacher. They loved my wife. She was 21 years old when I took her up there. They thought she was really something. And she is. She's everything they thought and more. But They loved the preacher. I never got one anonymous letter. I never got one anonymous telephone call. But I got down there to Gulfport, and I found out instead of a little heaven on earth, it was a feuding, fussing, cantankerous kind of church. The first week I was there, I was sitting in my office, and Deacon and his wife walked in, and they looked at me, glowered. They said, Preacher, you've got to fire that youth director. Poor old Spence. <laughs> the next day, another deacon and his wife came in my office and they said, you've got to fire that church organist. There went Sylvia Green, they thought. And the next Sunday, I got in the pulpit and I said, Hey, folks, I said, we need to come to an understanding here. I didn't hire any of these people, and I'm not firing them. If you want them fired, that's your job. But they just, a lot of them, look for something to fuss. Anonymous letters? Yeah, I got them. They call me everything but a Christian. (laughs) I got a phone call one night from the governor of the state of Mississippi who threatened to skin me from one end of the state to the other. You know, that sap sucker was blind as a bat. He was the only person in the state of Mississippi that didn't know that illegal gambling and illegal liquor were being sold on the strip between Gulfport and Biloxi. 
Everybody else knew it, but he didn't. And I happened to mention that in a sermon. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I learned some things with that. <laughs> but I learned if you fight sin, you're going to have problems. There's no doubt about it. I remember the first deacons meeting I attended in Gulfport. You know what time we left and went home? 10.30 p.m. Started at 7. What did we talk about? Nobody knows. <laughs> Just... Nah, 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 nah. Joanne asked me one day, said, Honey, how long are you going to put up with this? I said, From now on, I reckon. I said, This is where the Lord led me, and I'm going to try to hang in there with it. I said, You know, it seems to me it's kind of like riding a buck in Bronco. I said, I don't doubt that I can stay in the saddle, but I never can relax. <laughs> now, the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Gulfport is here today, and he's got at least two of his deacons and their wives who are here today. And I am sure that they would say, you know, I remember that. I remember most all of it. But eventually, things began to smooth out. The church came together. And we appointed a building committee, and after I had gone to Texas, they built a magnificent new building. That took unity, and it took cohesion. Jesus promised His followers three things. He promised that we would be entirely fearless. He promised that we would be absurdly happy. And He promised that we're going to get in trouble. Now, friend, if you're not ready for it, you better back off and take another look at your call. That's the way it is. But there's one other word, and that's the word persistence. Work hard. Stay after it. One of the finest things any church member can say about you is, that's a hard-working preacher. Why not? The people who pay your salary work hard. And they expect you to. And if you're not ready to give them full time, then maybe you'd be better off in daddy's business back home. There is no such thing as a 40-hour week in a growing church. It just doesn't come that way. You've got to put in the hours. You've got to work hard. But don't lose your family in that process. I had a seminary classmate who said that he had never taken a vacation for 15 years. And then he added, well, Satan never takes a vacation either. Well, I've got an answer for him. I couldn't think of it at the time, but the answer is, Satan is not your example. Jesus took time out. He went out into the wilderness all by himself to catch up and to take time to zero back in on the purpose that God had given him. Work hard. Don't quit. God's call to you is a call for life and make your plans accordingly. Don't be looking around. Don't be wondering how much money you could make if you left the ministry and went here, went there. You can make more money out there. No doubt about that. But that's not what God's called you to do. There's a lot more money in a lot of other vocations. But shape up. That's physical, but more important, that's a spiritual exercise. If you stay warm and ready through your commitment to the Lord's Word and through prayer. And if your heart's in tune with Him, I can guarantee you, you'll be shaping up. I read this some time ago. It's been a good while. It's called Anyway Faith. You probably have seen it. People are unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Love them anyway. If you're successful... You'll win false friends and true enemies. 
succeed anyway. If you do good, people will accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Do good anyway. <laughs> Honesty and frankness will make you vulnerable. Be honest and be frank anyway. The biggest people with the biggest ideas can be shot down by the smallest people with the smallest mind. Think big anyhow. People favor the underdogs, but they follow only the top dogs. Fight for some underdogs anyway. I remind you that what you spend years building can be destroyed overnight. Build anyway. Give the world the best you have and you'll get kicked in the teeth. Give the world the best you've got anyway. Some of you are familiar with the name James J. Corbett. He's former heavyweight boxing champion of the world. One day a reporter was interviewing him and asked him how he excelled in his profession. He didn't pause a moment until he answered, I just fight one more round. That's the answer. Don't quit. Measure up. Go one more round. Thank you, Dr. Level. Before we have our closing prayer, we're going to ask Dr. and Ms. Level and the Level family if you would slip on out our back door and meet us over there in Level, excuse me, in Hardin Student Center for the dedication of our Level Legacy Room. We'll invite all the Levels to just come right on out either side here and we will get you over there, give you a head start. I know what it's like when these students start heading for receptions. We don't want any injuries. We do want to invite all of you to join us over in Hardin Student Center for this reception. We will have refreshments over there to be followed by the opening of the Level Legacy Room and have an opportunity for you to do your first walkthrough of this wonderful tribute to one of the most influential families in the history of the Southern Baptist Convention. It's a most unusual story. Mr. Clay Corbin, Clay, are you here? You're scheduled to do our closing prayer. Come on up as you can. Again, our class schedule will be 12 o'clock, no earlier than 12 o'clock. And if we have to make it a little bit later, we'll announce it at the Level Center, but we'll plan on classes beginning at 12 o'clock. We'll see you all over at the Hardin Student Center following our closing time of prayer. I hope you'll make an opportunity to meet as many of these levels as you can. We'll probably not have that many of them ever gathered together in one spot in the history of the world. This is the opportunity. Uh, as we're calling on Clay to pray, I'd like to ask another couple to stand and let us say thank you to Mike and Ginger Moscow will kill me later, but uh, Mike and Ginger, would you please stand? Mr. Moscow is the one who's built our new student housing apartments back there for you. Some of the dearest friends this seminary has ever had. Mr. Corbin. Let's stand together. Join me in prayer. Father, thank You for Your call. Thank You for the legacy that we can participate in. Thank You for Jesus. Father, we love You. Help us to be faithful to share our love with You with everybody that we come into contact with. Bless this day. In Jesus' name, Amen.